Good evening, and welcome to tonight's Subiendo Dinner in the Centennial Room of Darrell K. Royal Memorial Stadium, home to the Texas Longhorns. On game days, the stadium can hold over 100,000 people, and we are excited to share this space with you tonight. I hope you all had a great day learning and discovering all you can about your, your challenges in healthcare and energy and environments and higher education. Your project is based on understanding why these challenges exist and how important your role as future leaders will be to solve them. Many of you visited with the research team to develop the questions you need answered tomorrow from our policy panels. So please keep up this inquisitive stage of your project this evening. Before we start our dinner, I would like to thank our keynote speaker for flying in to join us this evening. Ambassador Ron Kirk has served in numerous leadership roles throughout his career, affecting policy at the local, federal, and global levels of government. I encourage our students to inquire about his service and time as the former U.S. Trade Representative, whose responsibility was to develop and recommend trade policy to the United States President, Barack Obama. We look forward to hearing from Ambassador Kirk over dessert, and thank you for giving your time to be here, Ambassador. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our table host for joining us this evening. I appreciate you coming every year to be with us. This is such a great experience for our students to hear from you and for you to share your own experiences with them and your professional advice you might share and impart with these young leaders that we have with us. So thank you very much. If you wouldn't mind, I'd like to, if you wouldn't mind standing so we can acknowledge you and thank you appropriately. We also have um, representatives from the admissions office. I see, hi, there you are. Do you mind standing so our students can be sure to ask you questions at the dinner table? This is a very important role for you. Thank you. Since I know I stand between you and dinner, and as I will not make you wait as long as you did last night at the etiquette dinner, um, I will invite you to begin with your dinner. We will reconvene over dessert when we will have Ambassador Kirk to speak with us. And for that, please enjoy your dinner. Well, now I would like to invite Astrid Alvarado, who will be um, introducing our keynote speaker. So Astrid, will you mind joining us? Tonight's keynote speaker is Ron Kirk. Ron joined the firm Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher in April 2013, served as the 16th United States Trade Representative, and was a member of President Obama's cabinet, serving as the president's principal trade advisor, negotiator, and spokesperson on trade issues. From 1994 to 1995, Kirk worked as the Secretary of State of Texas until he was elected as the mayor of Dallas, where he served from 1995 to 2002 and was the first African American to hold either of these positions. Actively involved in the community and recognized by a number of state and national organizations, in 2014, Ambassador Kirk was named by BET Networks and Icon Man as one of the 28 Men of Change, trailblazers whose formulas for success lie in empowering others at home and across the globe. In 2008, he was also named one of the one of the 50 most influential minority lawyers in America by the National Law Journal. He was a, a recipient of the McKinney Leland Leadership Award from Texas Southern University. A University of Texas Distinguished Alumni Award, Woodrow Wilson Center for Public Policy's Outstanding Public Service Award, the Young Texas Execs Award, and the Austin College Distinguished Alumni Award. Born in Austin, Kirk attended Austin College, graduating with a degree in both political science and sociology in 1976. He then went on to receive his Juris Doctor in 1979 from the University of Texas School of Law. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Ron Kirk. San Antonio. Let's see. This, is, this isn't working, is it? All right, we'll give up on that. Can you all, can you all, um, all right, will you work on the battery? I will try to do this Oprah style uh, and move around. I know. I wish I had money that I could go, you get a scholarship and you get a scholarship and you get a scholarship. So go get, no, I, I said, I wish I had money. <laughs> Don't start clapping. I'm not giving out. Uh, 
But uh, first of all, welcome to my hometown. Uh, welcome to my uh, alma mater, the University of Texas. And uh, congratulations to each of you. If um, to the other table hosts, first of all, I applaud you for being here. Um, is that better? Oh, that is better. <laughs> to the other table hosts, I so hope you are enjoying uh, meeting uh, these just incredibly gifted young people as much as I am. Uh, we've got uh, a diversity of students at our table. They are musicians and rocket scientists and leaders and physical therapists and soccer players and, and via or orchestral students and one incredibly curious macroeconomic political dynamo uh, in waiting. So we, we've been having great fun. But I was really flattered and honored uh, when Letitia asked me to come uh, and join you all because I love taking the opportunity to share with young people my own journey in the public service. And, and I love doing things like this because I sat at a table just like this almost 40 years ago. I, you know, I get tired, of, I, I come to these things and I always talk to young people and say, God, I'm old enough to be your dad. And they go, no, you're, you're way older than, than our parents. <laughs> So, but when I was in high school, I never will forget, I attended this, attended this leadership um, academy and I was a good kid. I was in the band, I sang it, I was a choir jock. I was a good student, I was a student body president. And I thought, eh, I don't know, it was just something to do, something, you know, in the summer. But I know when you're 16, 17, 18, some of these, maybe it's a chance to come to Austin, meet some other people, but a little of this whole leadership thing, you sort of think, Eh, I don't know, but and, and I found it interesting and disgusting with Miss Acosta what you all were doing today. And she told me you pulled topics out of a hat and you've been assigned to these leadership teams and now you got to work on these and come up with stuff. And I will never forget we did a similar exercise and I have always remembered it because it has served me all of my life, both in my career in public service and as a lawyer. And so we came in, we were divided into groups almost exactly the same size as you are. And I'll never forget, the first thing they did, they had a blank piece, piece of butcher paper, and you can all steal this and use it. And all we were told was that every group had to draw a picture. Now, at least they gave you all topics. I know you're saving the earth or cleaning up parks or doing healthcare scholarships. We were just told that we had to draw a picture. We were given no guidelines. And we had, you know, paint or Crayola or something. I mean, this is so long ago, it might have been Flint Rocks, but we had <laughs> something. And we all drew these pictures. And then we went on for the rest of our conference for the next two days. And they never mentioned these pictures. And at the very end of the conference, we come in for our last day. And they have up on a wall behind us all of these pictures. And they're all numbered by each group. And they explained to them the very last thing we're going to do is each group was supposed to elect one or two people to come up and tell everybody what your picture was about. And then everybody else in the room was going to critique that picture. And it became evident after about the third or fourth group, which groups said, OK, who's the artist in the group? Because those pictures were awesome. You could look at them and say, that's a city. That's a park. That's a car, that's a landscape. They had shape, they had form, they were recognizable. And then these other pictures were just this indecipherable mess. And they looked like a bunch of people who didn't know what they were doing drew them. But the most important part of that lesson was when it came time for people to critique the pictures, who defended them? And it was real obvious, real quick, that the groups that just picked the best artists and let them draw something, when people challenged that picture, then everybody else sat back and said, well, that ain't my picture, I didn't draw it. You know, let him defend it, he drew it. And then these other things that you were going, that's not a city, that's not a house. The whole team fought for him because everybody on that team had had a hand in drawing that picture. And the only point I'm trying to make to that is you go through life, you'll find, and I know it seems a bit heady now to think of yourselves at 18, 19 years, well, I'm going to be a leader. Maybe you will or you won't, but at some point in your life, you're going to be in charge of something. And you're probably going to be asked to lead something. You're bright kids. I hope you all go to college. You're going to do other things. But what you'll find, the best way to build a team, the best way to move an organization, 
is when you can put a paintbrush in everybody's hand and you let everybody get vested into drawing that picture and they're gonna fight for it. And that's what leadership and that's what teamwork is about. My journey started not quite a mile from where we stand right now. I don't, I know there are a couple of people here from Austin, but I grew up in Austin, in East Austin. I'm 60 years old, I don't mind until I'll be 61 next week, but I was born 1954, that's only important, but 1954 was the year that the Supreme Court decided something called Brown versus Board of Education that basically outlawed this whole notion that you could separately educate, for the most part, black and Hispanic kids from white kids and said, you know what, you gotta bring everybody get separate but not equal is not the rule of law. And ironically, 10 years before that, the Supreme Court ruled on another case that's a little more obscure called Sweat versus Painter. The same lawyer, this dynamic young lawyer named Thurgood Marshall, sued my beloved University of Texas that I'm proud has given me every award they had. They've given me the Young Texas X, the Distinguished Alumni Award and all that, but I reminded them, you know, when I was a boy growing up, my mom and daddy couldn't come to UT because it was closed off to people of color. And so Sweat versus Painter challenged the University of Texas is not letting students of color in they won that lawsuit. It ultimately led to the creation of what is now the Thurgood Marshall Law School in Texas, in, uh, at, at Texas Southern, but it also led to opening up UT in particular for whole generations of Hispanic, and we call ourselves black then, uh, but Hispanic and black kids to be able to attend that university. And I tell you that because notwithstanding my introduction, which is Phil, to references in my career in public life, my dream was always to be a lawyer. When I was the age that you all were, and people said, what do you wanna do? I wanted to be like Thurgood Marshall. I wanted to be the lawyer that continued this quest to make this country live up to all the promises that are embedded in our constitution that basically says all of us are created equal. The great thing about this country at the end of the day is we operate on this premise. Sometimes some people feel it's illusory, Sometimes people feel we haven't gotten there, but the great thing is we're always trying to perfect this notion that everybody's created equal, that there are no people born to a certain class and privilege. Everybody ought to have the right to ascribe to whatever dream you want and reach that dream, limited only by your willingness to work hard to get that. And one of the reasons I accepted the invitation to come share with you tonight is that by virtue of you being here, at least you've demonstrated you've got some kind of dream. You've got a commitment to some life different and better than what you have right now. And you believe that investing in yourself, investing in your education is a path to get there. And the good news is you are absolutely right. And I don't know where you're all from. I'm told you're from all over the state. You come from different circumstances. I would imagine, how many of you are gonna be the first in your family to go to college? It's most of you in the room. That is a great thing. That's okay. So you're gonna be path makers. You're gonna be path makers for other kids in your neighborhood, in your family, that they see you do it and say, if you did it, I can do it. And your parents are doing everything they can because they want you to have the one thing that they didn't get, and that's a chance to go to college. Because they fundamentally understand if you, the more education you have, the more confident you get the more you have the ability to do different things and dream big dreams. And so, one, I applaud you, and I'm begging with you, don't give up on that dream. Uh, I have two daughters, they're 23 and 26. One studied art history at Columbia University. The other one is a professional dancer. Uh, she danced at our high school for the performing arts. If any of you are close to Dallas, she went to Booker T, then she danced at NYU. As a father, I was not excited about paying that much money for a art historian and a dancer. <laughs> but the one thing that I told him, and it came back to haunt me, I always tell him, ultimately, you're gonna be best doing what you love. And all of you have family, you have friends. There's no one that is as hollow as someone who's just missing a little bit of joy because they got a job, but they don't have a passion. They're not doing what they love. And look, I understand that my parents had jobs. 
My parents had good jobs and they put us through school. My father was the first black male clerk in Austin, Texas. When we grew up, segregation was so complete. We had two black letter carriers and we had two Hispanic letter carriers because the white letter carriers wouldn't come to East Austin. But we had never had anybody of color work in the post office. So my father was the first person to get to work inside in the air conditioned building. And everybody thought that was a cool thing, except for my father, because my father's dream was to be a doctor, not a postal clerk. Now he went to work every day for 40 years. He put his kids through school so that we could all do what we wanted. But remember, we grew up in a period of time when they wouldn't let your grandparents and our parents attend this university and do some things. And while he was heartbroken, he did what he did to take care of his family. But the great thing is you pursue what really resonates with you because that's what you'll be best in. So that's what I told my girls. You gotta do what you love. Secondly, always trying to beat into them and instill into them and now they repeat it back to me. And, and as parents, we're always surprised when we find out you're listening. Because my kids were just like you, and I would talk, and they would just roll their eyes like, here we go, sermon number 1200, you know. And, uh, but I always taught them that a vision without a plan is a hallucination. And my whole point was, if, you're gonna, if I got to have this dancing daughter, then you better show, show me the plan. And so from the time she was 12 years old, she went to a dance academy. She went to our middle school where she could study dance. She then went to our high school for the performing arts which is the best performing arts high school in the country. The mayor in Dallas is coming out in me a little bit, but you Google the Booker T. Washington High School in Dallas. Uh, it's a performing arts high school. We've had more presidential scholars than any other school in the country in the last 10 years. And we've had, we have the only Latin jazz band in the country. They've won five Grammy awards. But my point is, whatever you wanna do, have a plan. And don't be deterred from that plan. And the hardest thing, and I hope you all don't go through the pressure that I did and the Trevinos did when we were growing up and studying and friends would make fun of us because we were good kids and we didn't want to hang out. They would even say stuff like, you talk white. And I was like, what the blank does that mean? <laughs> you know, I speak the King's English. But if you know you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, a physical therapist, an entrepreneur, then you study. You go to a good school, you get good grades, you learn everything you can, you find people in your community who do what you're doing and you ask them every question. You just keep peppering them and you just keep asking them, how did you do it? What do you think I wanna do? And you keep investing it. And you know what? Because of your curiosity, because of your education, because of your energy, you're gonna get there. Now, so I'm giving you all of this and you want, so how do you go from wanting to be a lawyer to end up then you know, being the U.S. Trade Representative to President Obama, to being the Mayor of Dallas, Secretary of State to Ann Richards, and sometimes fate intervenes. So I come to law school, I've got to work, because by, the, by this time, my par I'm the youngest of four kids, my parents put us all through school, but we all worked, and that's a good thing. And, and I was uh, working at the Capitol and interning for the legislature, because I grew up in Austin, and there's two big institutions in Austin. One with a tower and one with a dome, the University of Texas and the Capitol. And so I've always been involved in politics because I watched my parents march, protest. They were part of the struggle. I don't, have any of you seen the movie Selma? You should, good for you. Well, my parents were part of that, like your grandparents. As a young kid, one of the highlights of my life that I got to go meet Cesar Chavez at a rally here in Austin. And I knew who Martin Luther King was. And so the idea of not being engaged in civic life was just something that wasn't in my DNA. I knew I had to be responsible. I knew I wanted to be a lawyer, but I was always going to be involved in the say of our government because that power to vote uh, is, is the power to change everything. And that is my favorite scene in the movie Selma. For those of you who saw it, if you remember right before they're planning the march, there were these two young characters. One more familiar than the other. One was John Lewis, who's now a very famous congressman, but there was another guy, John Cheney, and they were part of something called a group called SNCC, Students for a Nonviolent Coordinating Society. But they wanted to go much harder, and they didn't understand, why are we doing all, why are we gonna go on this bridge and get beat, maybe killed, for just the right to vote? And if you remember that scene, that colloquy Dr. King says to them, You've got to understand the right to vote is the right to change everything. 
It's the right to elect a sheriff who won't sick dogs on us. It's the right to elect a city council in Ferguson, Missouri, in a city that's 75% African American. They have one black person on city council, two police officers. The right to vote is to change all of that stuff. It's the right to pick a president. It's the right to pick a government. It's the right to pick a legislature that understands the needs of the state and our young people, and that will invest in education instead of taking money away for it. So you gotta combine both of those. But anyway, through that civic involvement, my being around the legislature, one of the people I met was a young activist and county commissioner that we had elected here in Austin by the name of Ann Richards. And she went on to become governor. When she became governor, by then I was practicing law, I was married, everything was going. I was working my plan. I had my vision. I was a law partner in a prominent firm. Everything was going the way I planned it. And then Ann Richards said, I need you. And I need you to come help transform Texas. And I explained to a governor, I can't do that. I appreciate it. I supported you. That's your, what you do. I'm a lawyer. And I'm a lawyer with a wife and a baby and another baby on the way. And I like making money. I don't want to go be in politics. And she said, you're a knucklehead. And she appointed me. And she kept appointing me to things. And then next thing I know, the mayor's office came up in Dallas. And by then, I had worked in Austin. I had worked as a lawyer for the city, and I thought I got this. And so in 1995, I ran for mayor of Dallas. And I was able to win, and I was elected again. And then in 2001, I went through a, a, a period that my girls affectionately call, what was daddy thinking? And I ran for the United States Senate. I won the Democratic nomination. Didn't win the race, but I was running all around the country raising money because it's numbingly expensive to run for the Senate in a state like Texas. And I was in Chicago and I was begging for money. And we'd raise a little money and it was moderately successful. And when the event was over, I got on the elevator and literally right before the door closes, these two kids, I call them kids, these two guys get on. One guy's short and he's doing all the talking. And it's kind of typical stuff. Oh, Mayor Kirk, you're great, man. We support you. We followed your career. You're going to win. You know, yada, 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 BS, blah, blah, blah. And he says, my friend is thinking about running for the Senate in Chicago. Do you have any advice for him? And this guy hadn't said a word. I looked at this guy. He's kind of skinny. His ears are too big for his head. He hadn't said anything. And I said, well, I assume your friend can speak. What's his name? And he said, my name is Barack Obama. Do you have any advice for me? And I sort of suggested maybe he ought to change his name and told him <laughs> that he'd never have a career in politics with a name like that. Now you gotta remember this is 2002, which is after September of 2001 when a man by the name of Osama bin Laden had directed uh, the most atrocious attack on this country ever. But we developed a little bit of a friendship, not so much around politics, but around the fact that he was married to a professional woman. He had two little girls who were six and three. When I was elected mayor, I had two little girls who were six and three. And I had a wife who graduated from the University of Pennsylvania and thought she was marrying, as she said, an income producing spouse, not a future <laughs> political leader. But we bonded around our mutual ambition to serve the public. But how do you do that and keep your marriage whole and make sure you raise two good kids? And as you know, he ended up being president and gave me the privilege to serve and work with him. So that's kind of how I got from there to here. Uh, I'll close with a little bit of what I did. Have any of y'all ever, um, let me guess, other than, than Leon, which he spells lion, I still don't get that. <laughs> that's better than Obama. <laughs> the US trade representative is perhaps the most obscure one of the most important positions in the president's cabinet. It's in the news every day now because every newspaper is talking about how the president just got handed this huge defeat because all the Democrats refused to give him any more authority to go do trade deals. And all of that's coming out of the U.S. Trade Representative's office. It's an office 50 years old, and its only job is you represent the president and the Congress all around the world with all our trade partners. Why is this important to you? Because your generation, even now, first in your family to go to college, maybe all of you will go, maybe you won't, but the one thing I can tell you for sure, you're either gonna work for a company who maybe is a foreign company doing business here, 
Are you going to work for a company that may ask you, would you be interested in living in Mexico or Cuba or Africa or Brazil? For your parents and I, it was a big deal for a lot of us just to maybe leave Brownsville and come to UT or leave Austin and go to Sherman and Harvard. And that was a big deal. We were the first of our generation to do that. But your generation is a part of the most globally connected society ever, principally because I'm guessing, well, let me ask you this. Who at the table doesn't have a cell phone? So everybody here's got a cell phone. You don't have a cell phone? Oh my God. <laughs> I thought unicorns were a myth. <laughs> We should get you a pulp mobile, put a little bubble around you. But if you've got a cell phone, if you've got an iPad, you know the internet, you're connected to the rest of the world now. Everybody in the world knows what happened in McKinney, Texas now. And people who live all over the world, even though they have leaders that tell them you can't do this and that, they go on the internet and they look at the lives you lead here in the United States and they think this is pretty cool. And there are two elements of the way we've been raised in this country that the rest of the world admires and has embraced. One is freedom. The freedom to determine our own leaders. Second is the freedom to determine your own destiny. Now, not everybody wants to do it the same way we do, but the real story of the last 30, 40 years, the last 18 years while you all have been growing up, in the 18 years since you all have been born, Apartheid is no longer the rule of law in South Africa. People are free all over the world. And the one thing they all embrace is freedom and self-determination. And they all believe the best tool to get that is to get an education. It's why parents used to put their children in life rafts in Cuba and Haiti and just put them out and pray that they got to Miami with nothing else but just the hope that if they got to this country, they could get a chance to go to schools and change their lives. And in that society, in that world now, the rest of the world has looked at the quality of lives that we live and think, I want a piece of that dream. And now they have a little bit of money and they want to spend money. And again, because of the internet, they can buy anything anywhere. But the words made in America the most powerful brand in the world. Because people believe if I buy something made in America, it may work. And if it doesn't, I'll put it in a box and send it back to Apple and they'll send me another one. They believe if I buy Tylenol and I know it comes from America, my children will get better. In Africa, 95% of the drugs sold and consumed in the continent of Africa are counterfeit. How would you like to have a child with a fever or an upset stomach and sit there and play Russian roulette knowing that there's a nine in 10 chance that the Benadryl, the Tylenol, the Advil you give them is not only not Tylenol or Benadryl, could be something horrible. So the rest of the world really envies our way of life. And trade is one of the tools by which we link the world. And if you look at everything happening in the Middle East, all this stuff with ISIS, all this conflict, no one thing. No two countries that have ever done a commercial deal with one another have ever gone to war. If we're buying and selling stuff for one another, we're, we've sort of come up with a way. You make money, I make money. If we're both making money, we figure we got a way to resolve our differences than going to war. The most common denominator behind all of the atrocities that we see in the Middle East that you can't understand is the most abject poverty you've ever seen. There's no one more dangerous than someone with no job, no food, and no hope and believes they have no future. And so trade is not only a tool by which we sell people more stuff, but we give them hope. And that's why we do it. And it's important to us in the United States, if you don't remember anything else other than the vision without a plan thing, but know that 95% of the people in the world who can buy stuff now live somewhere other than the United States. And even though we still have the most dynamic economy in the world, we still make more stuff, our future is going to depend on our ability to sell all the things we make, all the things we do to people around the world. So I fed you a whole lot, told you a little bit what I do. I'm back to practicing law. I'm having fun. I still love this university. I love this country as imperfect as we are because we keep fighting to make it better. But those of you sitting around this table have the ability to do it. And then finally, I'll get real personal with you because 
I loved when I sat down, everybody was, I heard everybody whispering about how y'all went to an etiquette class last night. <laughs> and I told everybody, I used to do etiquette all the time. It was like, the hell with Julia Child. You know what? Because I grew up as a bus boy. 50 years ago, I was you all. My mother was one of 14 kids. They grew up in a little place called Maynard, Texas. It's where all the black people lived after Reconstruction. She was the only one in her family to go to college. She became a teacher. Her twin brother was the head waiter everywhere. The Austin Country Club, the old Sheridan Crest. And just like all families do the same, if you got one uncle who's a waiter, everybody gets a job. So at 14 years old, I was what they called a bus boy. They may call them something fancier now. It meant I wasn't old enough to serve food or liquor. So my job was to clean the tables and my job was to show up two hours before work and I would set the tables. I was the kid who put everything down. So you learn real quick. Okay, two forks on the left, a little fork on the outside, big fork on the inside, knife on that side. Don't turn the knife out because you don't want your guests to think the sharp edge is pointing them, turn it in, spoon outside the knife. If they're having fancy dessert, one fork's up top, they're having real fancy dessert and fish, two forks up top and a spoon for coffee, and then you put the plate in the middle and the bed, bread plate off. I know this stuff, the wine glass on the top. But my point was, I knew my stuff, but I was sick of serving white people food. I didn't want to do that for a living. Remember, I wanted to be a lawyer. But all those people that I waited on, they saw a busboy. And they soon, that's all I wanted to do. I was a skinny little black kid. It was segregation. They just saw a busboy. What they didn't see was what was in my head and what was in my heart. And my lesson to people in Texas now is that just because somebody's mowing our yard or fixing our roofs, or bagging our groceries, and they may not speak English as well as we think. If you just see a yard boy, or if you see a roofer, you're not seeing the future of Texas because you don't know what's in there. In one generation, I went from being a bus boy to the Secretary of State in the very state that wouldn't let my parents vote. I was the chief elections officer. In the city where John Kennedy was killed, I was sworn in as the first black mayor. And then for the first black president, I got to go all over the world and ride in cars with flags on them. I had white boys with guns taking care of me. <laughs> you know, I mean, that was okay. And that ain't nothing compared to what you all can do. Because even though you may be the first in your family to go to college, you got a platform that now that's a springboard because you've got your education, you're smart, most of you are gonna qualify for top 10 so you can go to Texas or if you are an underachiever like somebody at my table, you can go to be an agro-American if you have to. <laughs> um, but no, a and a great school. But the thing is, go to college, don't let anybody put any limits on your dreams. Don't let anybody just see you, you know, as a poor kid who then you tell them, I've got a vision, I've got a plan, I've got a roadmap, and because of Subiendo, I'm a rising star. And this is a state full of stars, and none are brighter than those of you in this room. So I'm proud of you, God bless you, and good luck in the future. I would like to thank you for coming and talking to us and guiding us in every token of appreciation. So again, those presenting me with this gift. Thank you so much. Thank you.